science tells us that genes specify potentials, but not outcomes. The, the realization of outcomes depends on support from the environment at every level. And it's the support that I love in that picture. The firm hands of the parents holding that newborn, who depends on them for everything. Not just for food, for shelter, for warmth and safety, but also for the linguistic nutrition and the mental exercise that will furnish that child's mind, build that child's brain and intelligence. Babies are born ready to learn, and we hold them in our hands over the first thousand days of their life, for better or for worse. The family is the world of that child. Now, for some children, it is for worse. Here, what you see are children living in poverty, uh, that, that children living in poverty are already behind by two years when they start school. So the blue line shows you advantaged families, higher in socioeconomic status, or SES, and the red line shows lower SES families whose parents have, have less education and less income. And what you see is a two-year gap at the starting gate that, that grows a little bigger. At best, that gap levels off and stays constant. It does not go away. How early do these gaps begin to emerge? Where do they come from? That's one of the questions that, that we're going to be asking and that modern brain science is illuminating. In this, in this graph here, what you see is the growth of brain structure over the first thousand days, about, about three years. And as, as you can see, the, the lower income families and the mid income families and the high income families, children from those families started out with similar volumes of gray matter. Gray matter are the neurons, the axons and dendrites that are so important in information processing. And it was only through experience in the world with poverty that these differences between rich children and poor children began to emerge and to get wider. Those differences are enduring and consequential. Now, there are many, many causes for those outcomes. We don't want to simplify, oversimplify that problem because many of these risk factors you see here all happen at once. I'm going to be focusing on just one, and that's inadequate opportunities for early learning. There are many children that don't experience a form of parental support that, in principle, could be available to everyone. And that's parents' ability to nurture their children's brain development through their social and verbal engagement with that little baby, through talking to the child in rich and supportive ways. Why should we talk to a child when it's not talking to us? A lot of parents ask that question, pretty reasonable. Well, because hearing language is how you learn it. It, it forms the basis of oral language skills, and oral language skills are really fundamental to intelligence. In the words of Jerome Bruner, an eminent cognitive psychologist, proficiency in oral language provides children with a vital tool for thought. And without fluent and structured oral language, children will find it very difficult to think. A pioneering study done in Kansas in the 1970s by Hart and Risley explored the origins of oral language knowledge. What they did was to follow 42 families from across a range of, of SES, from professional to welfare families, and they visited them once a month for one hour and recorded the children and the adults interacting in a, in a spontaneous way in the home, and then laboriously counted the words and analyzed all of that language. Their stunning finding was that by the age of four years, the children in the professional families had heard 30 million more words directed to them than children in the welfare families. Now, a lot of people believe that language is innate, but no matter how strong your belief is there, that is a difference that has to matter. So, let me introduce you to two little children, 18 months old. 
This is Juan, and Juan hears um, 100 words in five minutes on 10 different topics, color-coded topics. I mean, these aren't fancy topics. Hey, you want to play with some toys? Look, I got a bunny and I got a bear. And hey, the bunny's going to hug the bear. And look, the bear has tiny little ears and the bunny has long silky ears and they're just kind of like yours, those little bear ears. Um, nonsense, right? Absolutely obvious. But Juan doesn't know these things. He's learning about toys and animals. He's learning about bunnies and bears. He's learning about who has what kind of ears and how it relates to him. And now there's little Rosa. She hears five words in five minutes on two topics. One topic is, come on over here. Another topic is, here's some animals. And then four minutes of silence. Those were affectionate words. She's a well-loved child. But compared to the rich diet of, of, of language that Juan experiences, by the way, on a day-to-day -day basis, cumulatively adding up to a lot, uh, this is a very meager diet. These are examples of the extreme differences. And by the way, both of these children were in a low SES group uh, of, of uh, Latino families that we've been working with. So, how, do we, how are we going to, um, to measure these differences in language? Well, we, uh, have, our methods have, uh, have enabled us to measure the processing speed, something that you don't see in the behavior, but the, the mental processing speed of children as they hear a word. So when you hear a familiar word like dog, how quickly does the light go on, right? And, and this is going to change with, with development, as we will see. It's a very simple task. This little girl is 24 months, and she's sitting on her mom's lap looking at two pictures. Uh, she'll listen to speech that is uh, naming one of the pictures. And then, as you'll see, she'll look back and forth because she's eager to find meaning in this situation. Apple. See the apple? Do you see it? Where's the doggy? Right Can there. You see it? Show me the juice. Do you like it? Now, what we found was that at the time when children are just beginning to talk, around 18 months to 30 months, they make incredible progress in understanding as well, in processing speech as it flies by in real time. And now what we're going to do is follow one little boy uh, who, at, at three different intervals of six, of six months. He's going to start with him at 18 months, and you're going to see how he picks up speed in understanding. Now, the, uh, the, the, you'll see the stimulus underneath his picture. When the dots are red, he's on the wrong picture. When the dots are blue, he's moved to the right picture. Where's the doggy? Can you see it? Okay, he did pretty good. He knows what a dog is, right? He was over there. If this child was sort of sitting in the wild, on the rug, you uh, would think that that was a fairly fast response. But six months later, at 24 months, he's really picked up speed. Take the book. Check that out. You might not notice that with a naked eye, but he just knocked off 600 milliseconds from his reaction time to that word, measured by the red dot. 600 milliseconds doesn't sound like much, but it is huge in terms of brain speed. And now, at, uh, next, at 30 months, uh, it's great. He's, he's, he, he's, he nails it, and he knows it, and gives this cocky little smile. Where's the doggy? Can you find it? <laughs> Got that, right? Yeah, and so at 18 months, it was, where's the doggy? And then he shifted after the word was over. At 30 months, all he needs is, where's the doggy? and he places his bets early, right? And that's all you need. That's all you need to make your move because you're operating probabilistically on statistics. What this shows is that kids are using less and less phonetic information, which enables you to keep up with my 200 words a minute. So here's one way to uh, capture this impressive progress. So they all start at uh, 0.5, that's chance performance, because they don't know what word's coming up. Uh, and you see these children then at three different ages. As they get it, as the light comes on, the, the, the curves head upward. And what you see 
in children at different ages is the 18-monthers F, is, you know, they're starting their move at the end of the word, and they're moderately reliable, but by 30 months, they're making their move much, much sooner, and they're much more reliable. This is what we mean by, uh, by efficiency in processing. And I'll just tell you very briefly that, uh, that there is also huge variability at every age. So some of those 24-monthers uh, are as fast as the 30-monthers. And some of those 24-monthers are slower than the 18-monthers. And these differences matter. Where you are in that distribution at two years of age is predicting out to age five, out to age eight in terms of cognitive measures that are relative to school success. So we're tapping into something about mental processing speed that has to do with fundamental ability to make sense of human language. Okay, these were exciting findings. But, you know, in universities we have this tendency to study children who come from incredibly affluent, privileged families and then make claims about homo sapiens. So we decided to move out of the lab and into the world and over the next several years opened community labs. Here's our, there's our country club of a, of a <laughs> campus lab up there in the corner. Um, and then we have a community lab in the right-hand corner in uh, San Jose where we're working with low SES um, uh, families who are Spanish-speaking. We also have a 31-foot RV. I'm the proud owner of that. Uh, that is a mobile lab that, that we take up to Northern California to find English-speaking families who are lower SES. Uh, and then we also go to Mexico City in order to find uh, professional monolingual Spanish-speaking women who are equivalent to the Google and Facebook moms that live in, that come to our lab at, at Stanford. Um, so this way we're including linguistic diversity as well as demographic diversity. Now one important question was, if we looked at differences, or would we find differences between children varying in SES, differences in processing speed as well as in vocabulary that could explain, could contribute to those stubborn achievement gaps that are so relevant to school success. Uh, we tested this both in English and in Spanish. The results are the same. Uh, so you look at these children at 18 and 24 months in both, both groups there, and between 18 and 24 months, both groups make progress. Right? They, they gain in efficiency. But here's the more troubling finding. In the low SES group, it's not until 24 months that those kids reach the level of efficiency that the high SES kids started with six months earlier. Right? So you've got basically the same level uh, in much younger kids in the high SES group than in the low SES group. That's the beginning of the pulling apart of these trajectories that, that we started with there. All right, where do these differences come from? Well, back to Hart and Risley, uh, it, we asked, is it possible that the language that children are hearing at home uh, could be contributing to these differences in a language processing task that we know has what we call predictive validity that tells us something about how children are going to be doing later on. And we used a more modern technology than they did. It's called Lena. It's a little digital recorder, uh, especially for recording babies. And it, there's special clothing with a little uh, pocket here. You put the recorder there, and then you can record the baby uh, just, just loose in the world without an observer present. Well, not entirely loose, but we weren't there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, get a 10 or 12 hour day recording. And it counts the words. It counts the words. That's what's quite amazing about it. Um, all right, so here are some results uh, from a study of 29 families. These were all Latino families living in the Silicon Valley with an average education level of maybe sixth grade and very low income. Um, what you see on the, I mean, the x-axis, they're all the different families. Each bar is a different family. But what you see on the y-axis is the number of adult words per hour. Huge variability within this low-income group. The most talkative family, there are 1,200 words an hour going on, or more than that, 1,500 words an hour going on. And down there at the bottom, very, very little. Okay, so the blue is all the speech the child heard. Maybe that's what matters. 
The green is speech that was addressed to the child. We suspected it was that that mattered, not just overheard speech, not television, and these sorts of things. So there you have to listen to those 16-hour recordings uh, and make the judgment about whether it's child-directed speech. Here's where our two little friends fit into that distribution. Right? There's, there's Juan here on, on, on the right uh, and little Rosa on the left. And what you see then is huge differences among low income families in how much speech they are providing to their child. Does this matter? Oh boy, does it matter. This is a curve showing the processing efficiency of children who heard more speech at 18 months, that's in red, and children who heard less speech, maternal speech, at 18 months. This is again a processing measure of how quickly they're looking at the picture, and this is a very substantial difference already by 24 months in their ability to grab that word and go with it. Now, I've been emphasizing SES differences uh, as if SES was destiny. It's not. When you add to our sample of Spanish-speaking families, th those from uh, in the Bay Area, those from Mexico, you get a distribution that looks like this. The lower SES families are the orange bars, the higher SES from Mexico City are the green bars. Kids who heard the most speech have the, the, the moms from Mexico City. Kids who heard the least had the moms who were the immigrant moms to, to, uh, the, Silicon, to the Bay Area. But look, look, look at all that variability in between. Th this is hopeful news, right? Because it suggests that we're not talking about some fundamental a you know, fundamental behavior of a particular group, but rather we're talking about speech to the child that matters, not SES, per se. It's speech to the child that is what's important. Why is it important? We've shown that it is, but now we're interested in thinking about, you know, what is nourishing about the way we talk to kids? Well, here's a good example. You're out in a walk with your little two-year-old, and you say, look at the kitty on the bench. Child knows the word kitty. If he is slow to get that word kitty, the way you are maybe, when you hear a word in a foreign language, and then just say, I think I know that, I think, yeah, I got it, right? And the whole rest of the sentence went off without you. <laughs> uh, if you're slow to get kitty, then bench goes off without you. If you're quick to get kitty, you get bench for free. <laughs> Nobody has to go and say, hey, look at the bench, right? Because you've gotten it by inference. So the child who interprets familiar words more quickly can attend to unfamiliar words that follow uh, and thus can learn new vocabulary through inference. So this is one of the benefits of speed uh, in processing. It's not just 200 milliseconds, life's long, who cares? It's that that buys you processing capacity that is really helpful in building vocabulary. So back to where we started. The first thousand days of life are an extraordinary period of potential for learning. We need to take advantage of this. We need to provide parents with the knowledge and the skills that they need to empower them to help their children, to support their children, to nourish their children's brain development. Babies are born ready to learn, but only with our support will they achieve their potential. Thank you. <laughs>